and versus where we are in 2024, the world has changed, right? The way we make our transactions to the way we away loans to the way we renew our insurances uh, to you know the, the the way we invest in mutual funds i think everything the whole banking industry has changed right the way we the, the way banking happens has actually changed uh, when we look at some numbers around it right like i think even the numbers are talking more and more about it i think bfsi is the only sector which is growing at a cagr of 30 31% today in the country right and if you look at the average of last 15 years it was around 15 percent and now it's growing at about 30 percent which is definitely a reason there must be a reason behind why this growth has happened uh, from mutual funds po point of view i think we've grown six folds from uh, people taking broking uh, stock broking accounts have grown significantly i think we're becoming the fifth largest stock broking in the uh, stock broking uh, country in the world uh, if you look at the overall, um, you know, insurances, 40% of insurances are hap renewals are happening online, right? So, I mean, so much has changed in the BFSI sector. Who do you want to give the credit to? Like, what do you think, you know, has ha made this happen? Uh, obviously, technology, obviously, AI, machine learning, cybersecurity, KYC, Aadhaar. I mean, I can, I can, we can go, go on. But one of the most important thing is the way we have changed the customer experience, right? Like the way we have actually made BFSI uh, or uh, BFSI simple, availing a loan simple, uh, you know, investing in a mutual fund really, really simple. Over clicks, someone was telling me that earlier investing in mutual funds used to be like 27 signatures. Someone would come to your office and f put a file in your in your office, and then you'll have to sign those uh, form, right? And re redemption was equally difficult. Change was equally difficult, right? Now, now it's like just over a click, you can think about it, and you can actually make it happen. So. BFSI sector has been forefront in the in the whole transformation, right? And on that note, uh, I would want to you know bring in my panelist on, right? I want to hear from each one of you, uh, you know, a little bit on um, on how customer experience has actually give you given you a competitive edge uh, in the market, or or how has it you know uh, how have you implemented customer experience, or how has it changed the way you market today, right? And we could do talk about a little examples that will just make it more. Um, meaningful yeah you want to go first? yeah no worry. I thought this was the order ah, okay <laughs> <laughs> go ahead go ahead right uh, so you know uh, it's very simple right now so it's there is no rocket science uh, the two things the two pillars that we normally focus on is one we will have to cut down the learning curve of our customers I d we don't want our apps to intellectually challenge our customers and you know uh, test their IQ we want our apps to be as simple as possible so the customers come in, they do their business, they move out. It is as simple as that. Second, we want to, maintain, we want to ensure that we are relevant to what our customers are looking at. These are the two pillars that we think that, I mean, that's what I have been trying to do. That's what the industry leaders that in, in the broking business over a period of time they have been trying to do, is to make sure that the, all the innovations across experience, they have these two things at the forefront, right? What we are doing, what we do, I mean, if I have to take an example which is very specific to JM Financial Services, we are trying to create, uh, rather we have actually created a hyper-personalized nudge engine that we call an HPNE. So what it does is it, it actually, uh, you know, tracks the customer movement in the app. It actually sees how the customer is behaving in the app, what are the things that he is doing, what are the things that he is buying, selling, investing, and spending more time on. And we try to create a very curated experience within that app. What we have, you know, the concept of one customer, that each and every customer is different than the other, is, I, I think it's absolutely pivotal in creating experiences which are very, very specific, very, very personalized. So I think, uh, you know, uh, personalization, of course, is a very, very important point in creating such experiences because then it gives a feeling that you truly know whom you're interacting with, the the brand truly knows whom we're interacting with. And, it, and it's a tremendous high for any customers to see that the brand gets them, you know? Yeah. So this, this is the thing. Sure. Raghav. <laughs> sure. Great. Uh, no, I think we hit the nail uh, right on the head. The simplicity, personalization. I think in this room also, we have like 100-odd BFSI 
customer experience is sitting right there. I mean, it's a product that touches everyone's lives. Yeah. And, uh, you know, one way or the other, we all have an experience story, whether good or bad. And we have it pr practically on a weekly, daily basis. So, yeah, a very important topic and rightly, you know, simplicity. Me being a consumer as well as a provider, so I can relate to that. And I believe in today's time, especially when, you know, uh, there are so many choices and there is so many, there's so much awareness about the choices that a consumer has and the patience level going down in consumers. It is very important that uh, whenever we are interacting as a brand, that we are providing the right uh, experience. I mean, the, uh, the touch points that are coming. So otherwise, I mean, the turnover rates and everything just, you know, just goes crazy. So uh, continuing to your points, simplicity, I think is critical important. And with the number of companies, like we work with, we work with a lot of BFSI uh, folks, you know, in driving retention, customer experience, and, you know, things they can do. And again, it is, uh, if you have to do it at scale, it can only be done digitally. It cannot be done offline in a way. And uh, whether it's using AI or whether it's doing personality cohorts or whether it's just driving, you know, city-based, uh, personality-based, Lookalikes, you know, there is so much stuff that we are uh, that is happening that is driving customer experience. But I feel there is no one size fits all solution here. Uh, typically, you cannot be everything to everybody. You have to be something to somebody. So I think as more and more we put on these cohorts out there uh, and drive experience based on those personality cohorts, I think we drive a better experience for the consumer. Thanks. So at Tata Mutual Fund, for us, we keep the customer at the center of everything, from, from taking a smaller decision to a bigger thing. So that's sacrosanct. And in today's digital age, we want to be a human-first brand. So I, when I say human-first brand is, I'll give you a, just a simple example. Uh, we get a lot of requests to understand their portfolios, tax, uh, if they want any tax, uh, tax receipts or something like that. So for, uh, so just to quote an example is, for example, if a customer has asked for a tax thing in a month of June, and if in the next June, even if he doesn't ask, we will ping him, saying that so this is the, what you have asked for, do you need this now? Something, how can you be, while this will talk about personalization, which this will talk about everything, because tools are there, CDPs, CDP tools are there with everybody and everyone, right? how can we be different? That's the whole thought. And keeping a human-centric approach, keeping, so my, my overall thought is, you know, how can I be a friend of a customer? That's my ultimate goal, because when I'm talking to my friend, I know he's there for me, and I don't have a difficulty asking him, and he, I'm 100% sure he'll give it to me from a solution, whether it is through a call center, whether it's through a chatbot, all <coughs> things are there. But how can I be, so every decision which we take and everything which we do, we have a very human-centric approach. Uh, while machines are there to support it, we need to have that human-centric approach across. So that's how, how we work with, yeah. Yeah, sticking on to that human-centric approach, right? Like, and I'll just, just ask one very important question, right? BFSI has largely been human-centric for a very long time. Now with scale coming in, how do you achieve that balance, right? Where the customer experience is not compromised, uh, why, alongside you're able to scale and talk to a lot of customers uh, and, 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 you know, still build that relationship, right? Because earlier, if you remember, the, the whole experience, the relationship was very one-on-one -on -one in, 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 in BFSI. So how do you make that happen specifically in, you know, in your industry, which is, again, uh, very, very, because you're, you're, you're actually asking people to give money. You're not giving money. You're actually asking people to, you know, invest on your platform. Yeah. So uh, I will again uh, tell you this with an example which you would want to quote and we have just done it like two months back and we have done a hyper personalization which is like so for some five lakh clients which we have done a pilot with. I, uh, so typically what happened is that our, our business depends on cycles, right? Market is up, market is down, people want to invest so we have figured out certain cohorts of clients want to invest when the market goes down. So we, what we have done is the moment it goes down we will send out an emailer and a personalized video through that RM of his saying that, you know, do you want to? So there's a video which has been created through AI and along with the name of the customer, he just has to forward it, forward it and put the name of the customer, of course, and then the video comes in the next five or seven minutes and he has to forward it. Now you understand the RM sending a video saying that, so this is the, this is thing which has happened in the market. Do you really need to look at it? So I think if something like this happens, it is, it is like a very personalized thing, thing that this is, a, so for example, Ashish is, is a small view on uh, today's market entire thing which has happened and uh, 
I would like to see it at least because it isn't personalized to me and we are doing it on scale. So we have piloted it and now we are going ahead. So this is, I'm just giving you one example. There are examples of emails. So there are uh, emails, AMP mailers, which we have created where automatically data get pulled and every day the customer's portfolio has been sent on what has grown, what has not grown. All these things are happening at a large scale. Yeah. No, I think I love the first example, I think, you know, where you still have the human touch and you have a technology play in, in, in driving that personalization plus uh, that human ex touch doesn't go away. Uh, interesting. Anything from both of you, anyone wants to jump in to give an example or anything, uh, how you are managing the human versus technology play? Yeah, so in our business, you know, uh, stockbroking, right? Yeah. Stockbroking, somehow or the other, we feel that there should be some person who is there. I mean, I don't think we have crossed, I mean, of course, if you see the likes of Zerodha, Grow and Upstocks, they might have a lot of clients who are purely DIY. Yeah. But if you see the traditional, uh, you know, brokers like the HDFC of the world, ICIC, even JM Financials, we also have the brick and mortar models, right? So we have 100 plus branches where, now, what we have done is that we have divided our customers into two parts. One is a DIY, uh, you know, sect who believe they can do it themselves and one, another one is the managed customer. So for managed customer, we have the touch points those are typically large ticket size clients so they need a li because uh, the ticket size is big the money involved is big they will always need someone in the middle now human interaction right now is currently used as a trust badge not m not necessarily as someone who would help you with the process just someone's name flashing on the screen probably is is you know it's enough to give certain sense of uh, confidence you know in the uh, you know uh, in the investors we have something we have developed something called as a, a customer uh, you know prediction uh, customer activity prediction model you know so we understand that uh, you know we are trying to understand it's at a very nascent stage we are trying to understand that which customer when we are onboarding has a high probability of doing it DIY or they might need assistance, you know, uh, assi uh, assistance at any point in time. So we add a certain score to it, we have a threshold and when certain threshold gets crossed, we get them to the managed services and if it is below the threshold, we, uh, you know, uh, give it to the DIY platform. So Blinkx in, in our ecosystem is a DIY platform, whereas the GM Pro <laughs> is the managed one. So we have that model where we bifurcate we keep on catering to both the kind we of are catering to, we are very greedy we, we, <laughs> cater, we cater to both of the and we and uh, yeah that's how we are managing yeah, i think it's a volume game right like it is a it is yeah, a volume so you game. want both sides you don't want to lose the future and you don't want to let go of the present right you yes, want yes 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 you know, it is very interesting i mean uh, just a couple of weeks ago we found that there is there has been a lot of transition from the diy model to the managed model it was very surprising for us to see in this sector that how was this is possible but we realize that when their portfolio is increasing exactly what is that inflection point when people want to move to managed yeah, yeah. services then they are moving to the managed services yeah. yeah are you seeing it as an age phenomena or or a portfolio uh, phenomena like at a certain portfolio level people want to go to a managed service? at a certain portfolio level but you are right there is certain so there is uh, to be exact it was 37 years 2 months I mean, that is the, I mean, probably, I don't know, I don't, if I say it middle age, I don't know how many people will be offended, uh, but uh, let's not call it that, let's. This is when, I think your portfolio would have also reached a certain, maturity, cer yeah, certain yeah, yeah, level yeah, yeah. and yes, you know, you would yes. want it to be better managed, etc. Yeah, yes, yes, and yes, avoid yeah. the volatility, right? Yeah. Someone told me recently that, uh, you know, that today it's the world of humans with a touch of AI, but in future it's going to be the world of AI with a touch of human, right? Like, and going back to your thing about how, uh, you build those algorithms at the back end to, to you know, to ape how, uh, how a human would actually react to, uh, to, to the portfolio movements or to someone's uh, behavior. Very interesting. Um, you know, anything from a personalization, right? Like because both of them spoke about personalization and I think that's also one of your forte uh, of bringing personalization at scale. Uh, want to give some examples of... Uh, how yeah. some campaigns have helped in this? For sure, for sure. So, firstly, I think both of them said the right thing. Like, I think there is a large generation of people out there. For them, you cannot replace the human element, the managed service. You need an account manager, a relationship manager. But I think for at least the newer age users, for them, uh, they want a positive experience. Like, coming back to customer experience, they want a positive experience. They don't care if it comes from a human or a machine. As long as when they come to the platform, their work is done, they are able to operate in a seamless manner, get the goals done, I think they're happy. 
and they come back they go back positively and come back like i can share my experience i can share company's experience but like something to borrow from you know something like uh, what we are trying to do for bfsi but something that's already happened with say maruti suzuki yeah. what they have done is they have uh, if a lot of your maruti car owners so they have for the large part had put a sunset on their call center business most of their calls have become automated and it is so personalized that if uh, the caller says the bot says hello and you say you know namaste or uh, in any other language the bot will intuitively change its language yeah the bot will actually adapt and discuss and it will have all your data fed in it will know okay maybe your emi i'm not saying this can be implemented across the board but the pilots that we are doing right now for example if someone has a 3000 seat call center which they are using to say you know drive recovery yeah like a bank is using okay so maybe can we experiment with 100 seats to put that ai personalized model the person knows the history the person so these are the kind of pilots that we are happening uh, obviously uh, it's a uh, paradigm shift it's a mindset shift yeah. and it is not even a perfect system. It is still evolving. But uh, I think uh, brands are more and more keen to, you know, take that plunge and at least give it a try. Like five years ago, doing this was unthinkable. Now everyone wants to do a pilot. Yeah. No, I think uh, with generative AI, right, the way we are talking today, it's, it's making it all uh, possible, right? Like I think other, unless until, uh, until generative AI, I think it would have been a distant dream and that also gives me, you know, and we'll come to that question later is what's going to be the future of how CX, but we'll come to that uh, later. Go, uh, coming to you, um, Ashish, uh, from a personalization uh, and, you know, we'll just stay on personalization for a minute more, uh, is about, uh, you know, personalization versus intrusiveness, right? Like when do you become intrusive, right? Like suddenly some pe now with a lot of guidelines coming in from Meta, from pla from so many partners, GDPR guidelines are all over the country, right? Like we're all being like really careful about uh, how we've been approached and why being a, why we've been approached, right? And and how much information of me being, is being captured, how much of it is known to me and how much of it is not known to me. Uh, from all of that angle, right, uh, how, what's your take on that and, you know, how are you uh, maneuvering your way uh, into this uh, uh, era? Yeah. Uh, good question, I will tell you, because uh, it's a very thin line between it and you, a marketer has to read between it. Yeah. Uh, so for us, what we do here is very clearly, you know, we track each and every, uh, through which each and every communication goes out. So, and then the open rates of it, click rates of it. So we understand, we have developed algorithms to make sure that, for example, if a person is not opening a mail, then what should we sent to him, so WhatsApp, SMS, and this is done automatically through CDPs. And what is the next, so what is the best medium for him? What is the best time for him? We understand that. And if still a person is not doing, for example, he was doing it at a particular day on a particular time, and he's still not doing after sending two, three times of communication, we understand, think that is there something really bothering him? And then we pass it on that data to our call center, he will do a call. But if there is a certain no, then we will not touch him at all for next two months, three months because I just don't want to lose a customer because of over communication also. But this is happening at a completely data level. We understand, for example, uh, so this we also, we have made a algorithms to say that, you know, what should be your next best offer for a customer. At the same time, it tells me saying that this customer is disinterested in your communication. Is there a way where you can speak to him or, you know, do a manual interaction so that he doesn't, uh, he doesn't, you know, uh, forego his SIP or he doesn't stop his uh, SIP contribution or something like that. So we do it on a regular basis. There, there are algorithms which are there and that tells you saying that this is, this is in red, amber, green sort of stuff. And basis that we do some human intervention as well. But I agree, uh, we have a calendarized approach to every communication and we make sure that who are not opening it or, or anything which is, which is not interested, we'll make sure that we won't do over communication with that. But this, is happen this happens all automatically. No, I, think, I think BFSI industry is uh, much abused from that point of view, right? Like over communication, over selling of loans, over selling of cards, like unlimited calls coming and you're trying to like really make a reason of, hey, I don't want it, right? And you've actually told that caller or that person or that voice bot that I don't want it, I'm not, but you still get that call again, right? So there's a pressure between business and a pressure between customer experience, right? Like the business would have said, 
sell the loans or sell the cards or increase the AUM, whatever, right? And then you have a pressure from the customer who is not interested or probably not. So how do you, uh, you know, like handle this, balance this internal versus, yeah, go ahead. So I'm saying here the CDB plays a role. You should have a unified view of a customer, right? Yeah. So with a unified view, it clearly tells you that this person has been called twice, sent SMS thrice, once WhatsApp, so you know how much time you would have reached and then that you have to say no communication, then there is an auto flag which happens. So yeah. this happens automatically with us, but I think it is happening with most of the customers. Correct. Yeah. How many of us in the audience face this challenge, right? Like over communication by the BFSI players with a show of hands. So there are definitely a few of them in the audience, right? Like we definitely face this challenge, a lot of us, right? And um, yeah, and I agree with you, a lot of players have actually worked on it, but there would be a lot who still need to walk that path of, you know, building that algorithm, when to stop and when to start. And uh, even after try guidelines, right? Like customer experience sometimes get compromised because try is also trying to build in that. Uh, yeah, oh, sorry, so, uh, Navneet, you were saying. No worries, sir. So, uh, you know, um, I'll just answer this uh, in in few. Um, I'll just try to be as brief as possible, though it's a little complicated process at our end. So our hyper personalized nudge engine, what it does is one of the things that it does is that if you are an active investor in equities, right, and if you are switching to FNO, it warns you that you know this is. It gives you a nudge that you know, hey, you are moving to FNO, and these are the things that might not be too favorable. So though, so I will not call them as intrusions, but as warning signals, right? No. Uh, Secondly, when I'm talking about, so intrusions is very perspective, right? Uh, uh, nowadays what happens with the influencer, everybody is, you know, going very uh, big on YouTube. People are, you know, when they're going to sleep, they are investors and then waking up as traders, right? So we, we believe that this, that a lot, I mean, even at the cost of appearing to be very intrusive, we believe that certain nudges are very important. Secondly, we don't cross sell at all because we understand the nuances of over communicating, right? We understand that. We don't do cross sell. We haven't started cross sell. Even at the risk of revenue, at the risk of business, we have not started cross selling yet. Uh, you have mentioned that point absolutely bang on. CDP is though everything falls in our CDP right from data from Omnisys, uh, you know, our delivery engine more engaged and you know, it get, it pulls in all the data and you know, it dumps onto the CDP and there's a lot of logic built which yeah. helps us to identify that this customer has uh, received so many communications and we didn't get it right in the first instance. We actually got bashed on social media, you know, because we were a new brand and we wanted to prove a lot of things to a lot of, you know, our board, our stakeholders and all that. We bombarded, you know, I have no shame in telling you that, you know, we have also done that. Yeah. Then over a period of time, we saw that our, our domain is getting a hit, you know, uh, and we are getting a lot of, uh, you are getting a lot of uh, our reviews, our app ratings, people are getting, people are taking out their, out their brand on app ratings, you know. So we took a conscious step and we identified very quickly this is something that we need to stop. We took a conscious call and now there is a cap on everything, right? It is cost effective for us also because WhatsApp messages is normally expensive. So it becomes, so we have actually stopped it. We have two to three messages across all channels as a cap on all our customers. So that, and if it is need based, then we sometimes exceed it, but that is the cap that we do it, do it on a weekly basis. Yeah, I think, I think there's a thin line, right? From delight to disturb. <laughs> so delight is, you know, when you really wanted something and you suddenly get that message like, oh wow, this guy, this, this, this brand really understands or this bank really understands my needs and disturb is when someone is like, hey, I told you I don't need it or it's like over communication, but I'm sure we're walking that path and hearing all of you and I'm, and I'm working with a lot of BFSI clients ourselves, we understand that we're walking that path to be a more uh, customer focused. I mean, we are a customer focused, more, more, more careful about, you know, the crossing the boundaries. Uh, uh, on that note, right, and you also mentioned YouTube in your conversation right now, right? Um, BFSI sector is also facing a lot of challenges from the fake influencers and the, f and especially from mutual funds yeah. broking and, you know, and that's also disturbing your customer experience in some form or the other. And I, and, you know, and if you, if you'd want to spend a minute on how are we curbing or are we making any strides towards that? Because that's actually disturbing specifically from, from the new to uh, broking or new to investing user, right? Who's, who's naive in the way he's approaching you. He's, and you are, you're actually doing your best in b building the right thing for him. But, somehow the middle layer is being 
exploited really, really bad. Um, so just a quick, uh, and I think RBI is doing a lot of work in making sure this, SEBI is also doing a lot of work. Uh, as brands, right, uh, uh, you know, how are, how are you guys combating this uh, challenge? I'm coming to you and, uh, after this. No, no, to any of you guys and then I'll come to you. Yeah. So we have our ORM tools, right? So f through that we keep on tracking on a 24 hour basis. Yeah. Uh, except WhatsApp, we can track social. So basis that if there are complaints, if they, if somebody is, because people, if something happens, first thing they put it on social media now. So we keep on tracking it. We keep on, so first is awareness, which we do on a regular basis. That's uh, sacrosanct. If you see our website also, we'll have banners, which we, we do a lot of newspaper advertisements. We, we have done all those things. We do email communications and sort, sort of stuff, which we have been doing it. Uh, but one is awareness and one, how can we track who, who is doing that mischief, okay? So we are in constant touch with cyber security, police, we are uh, speaking to, uh, you know, uh, through ORM, we are understanding what customers are facing those problems and we are then speaking to them and helping them file a complaint. So all these things are happening. So one is, of course, awareness is very important, but you know, the person who has lost his money, how can we help them at the core of it? We are also doing that. So it's, it's a two-way approach, how we can help them and create awareness about it. So we are doing that through multimedia which is there and I am also on an amphi body. So we are really coming up with a big campaign using all the stars which we have saying that you know, uh, Bharat sahi I'm just giving a glimpse of it but I'm saying we are speaking about that so that you know, and we have faced this in mutual funds, we have seen a lot of people impersonating our fund managers and so on and so forth and you know, people losing out money. So mm. to stop that, we are doing it doing as an industry-wide campaign which will be doing it. But at our scale, we are doing a lot of awareness and of course helping people who have suffered. Yeah. Sure. Anything at your end? Any measures? Yeah. So R is a very, uh, very vulnerable industry, yeah. stock. So everybody is looking for that multi-bagger. Yeah. Right. <laughs> now the thing is, the only problem is that we have like the best, one of the, everybody, like they will have the best research team, right? But the only thing is that the research report goes through 30 pages, 40 pages, right? But people do not have that, uh, uh, that patience to go through it, right? Yeah, we don't and have more than one minute. Yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. what happens, you know, these influences, you know, uh, one thing I realized that we cannot stop them. We cannot stop our consumers to not look at influencers. But what we can humbly request them is to make sure that they do their background check with them. Now, SEBI has done some, has taken some amazing steps, you know, to curb this thing down. The, the one of the best, one of the only thing that you can do is to just make sure that that entity, that influencer, is a registered entity, right? That that SEBI, uh, you know, makes sure. And now, I think as compared to before, the awareness is quite high. Another thing that we are trying to do is that we are trying to adopt the way influencers speak. You know, we are trying to create certain videos which will be less on jargon, you know, backed by a research report. You will give our research report link and we will try to summarize and make sure that we to take out the points and, and you know, make some small usable snackable assets either in statics or in, in video format and give it to our customers, you know, so that uh, they can understand, they can expect that same sort of simplicity from brands like us that they are used to with the influencers, right? All we have to do is to make, see, we have the trust badge with us, right? And our consumers, they need to understand that we have that legacy. We have been doing this day in, day out. This is our bread and butter. And, uh, you know, we have a lot, we have put in a lot of effort in that. And we are not, and here, we are here for a long term. So that is what they need to understand. And uh, probably that's where we can, you know, uh, get back, uh, you know, uh, you know, get back the customers probably who, uh, get back the trust of those customers who have lost significant amount of money by following some random, uh, you know, influences. Yeah. <laughs> no, I think uh, a couple of films have been made on on the on this, right? Yeah, but uh, awareness is definitely a very important means of you know making uh, combating this. Um, on on, I think one interesting point that we keep figuring about is uh, omni-channel experience, right? Like, and when I say omni-channel, I mean online to offline, my branch, mein hu, mein, you know, I'm visiting your app, I'm on your website and I'm on your, how are we, uh, you know, and, and that's also very critical, right? Like I think, and you know, and you can Raghav jump in if you, if you have any, uh, because you're w working with a lot of other clients also, and maybe it, it could be non BFSI, which could add us to uh, giving, uh, giving a good example of benchmarking to, you know, how an omni-channel experience would, uh, yeah. would be great. Yeah. So, uh, 
you know the previous point that we were discussing you know intrusiveness uh-huh. so what we have observed is one of the biggest ways to curb intrusiveness is actually having a larger omni channel strategy so not just you know bombarding someone who's watching youtube with like your ads you know uh, a large number of times but you know okay this person goes to the branch this person uh, you know watches connected tv watches linear tv watches a movie uh, watches basically a live event maybe the olympics then this person reads news of time on uh, times of india this person plays this game so first uh, so there are two parts to this first is obviously making sure you know how are you tracking all this that if all that data and all the impression is that all the customer touch points are getting tracked so i think this is the first point and the first recommendation the first push needs to be done and then if everything is getting tracked then you know if as an extension of the point you mentioned on cdp that as an extension of cdp can we build like a later funnel targeting like i know how many emails or how many whatsapps i sent but do i know okay how many times did uh youtube uh, this guy got targeted or this girl got targeted or how many times you know we are able to do a much stronger offline online branch push so i think data time with the omni channel strategy is to good it will not only reduce uh, the intrusiveness but it will also create a presence of mind in the mind of the customer about the brand we feel sure uh you want to add ashish anything on this so, one from an omni channel experience you need to understand see important is what data right so we have been saying data is the new oil and all but i feel data is the new soil because what you put into it it will grow right and hence you need to have a right sort of data getting into your main system or what we called is like a central database or you know and then that can be used across for example as he said you know for example if a person has been first touched by a distributor and he has bought in through it and then for his next journey he has used an app or for his service thing he has emailed me and then i have helped him as a query so i should have this entire thing and for that the entire thing i should fit that entire thing to my central database then i can pick up and have a one view of a customer so first we sh- we all should aim at you know how can we ingest the right data because for that omni channel experience data is the important thing and having a right data points with you helps you understand that and then devise your strategy to give you the omni channel experience i'm saying it's easy but it's, it's a difficult task but for that you need to gather from your branch database and the most of the companies will have that for example you will have a crm system which is different it has to talk to your cdp you might have a different from google so data or sub legacy data so how can you make it like a complete feed into a system and then get that data and use use a use a use a software on that and give that omni channel experience so that's my point and how we are also trying to do it however we are also struggling in certain cases to get data from branches and all sort of stuff but we are doing it sure sure yeah anyway you are overcoming these challenges everyone is trying to overcome the omni channel challenge but i think yeah i, I agree with you that you know a lot of it can actually be done by having um, a, a one view of a customer which is you know definitely going to establish the uh, and and i also understand the point when you know because we have been Uh, there are two kinds of bfsis existing today one is the traditional ones which have been there for years and then there are the new ones the fintech ones that we call them the technology first bfsi they probably have a have newer systems and we have our old data and the new data and the new technology so i think the challenge uh, lies there but uh, but but at least we are st- striving striving towards um, you know having a one view of a customer uh, okay um, so so since we've spoken so much about customer experience right i want to just quickly head on to a very important point which is uh, how do you measure and if we do measure right like how do you measure where you're faring in your customer experience world right like am i um, you know faring good bad ugly is there a matrix is there a you know formula that you guys apply to measure that or not or are we thinking of something in this line i want to quickly hear um, you know and we have less time now so we'll quickly head on to this question from you Uh, yeah no, so uh, you know there are many fancy things which are there like customer satisfaction score and you know I'm sorry to please don't take offense no, I, no. i don't not too much of realism you know, is what we need yeah <laughs> not a big fan of nps and all that i'm sorry uh, you know but i think if you're an app based business your uh, app reviews uh, the the type the app reviews and the type of rating that you're getting you just hold on 
to that very very close to your heart spend as much as we spend as much as time as possible in the orm and looking at the sentiment clouds and whatever things are being spoken about us because you know there are certain things that can be done in and you know you have to get down and get your hands dirty there are you can't be too intelligent or too clever and smart about handling customer experience it can only be done when you have the right uh, you know right intention there and i think your app reviews the the type of rating that you are getting it speak volume about uh, volumes about it and that is the only metric to be honest that is the only metric that we do we have a dedicated team who spend almost entire day looking at the review comments we have uh, you know uh, a team dedicated orm team who gives a two hourly report on what is being spoken about us in social media across all the channels and we take them extremely seriously so that's the that that's the that is and that will be the north star for us no very interesting i think having ears to the ground and having ears to the to what people are saying orm sentiment score brand love scores are very critical uh, you want to add something on this one if you have something uh, so we have a parameter called customer love customer love customer yeah. love we call yeah. it customer love and it is the point uh, he gets into the buying session to the point he has a policy and if he redeems it at every stage we take the feedback so that's one point of it uh, but then there is a concept of cltv which we call customer lifetime value Correct. now what happens is you know for for and what we have seen with us is because uh, the trust is an important factor along with that and when money is there so we always measure cltv also along with the customer love as a concept customer love is much more softer and much more yeah, while cltv is much more roi specific so that's how we look at it yeah and uh, if you don't mind how do you measure the customer love so Because there are so I'd say, reviews as you said nps uh, is of course which is which is another thing uh, third thing is also what happens is that you know if a, i'll just give you an example of uh, if a person comes on our website uh, and he has scrolled for 90 seconds or so and but he haven't bought anything or he haven't found anything we will have a pop up going up saying that do you want to know something and rates rate us basis that now that helps us to understand whether the customer experience on a website is better post call center there is a automated message which goes saying that you know how was your call do you want to rate us so every function gets measured and basis this the numbers are collected numbers have been showcased every month with top management and we do analysis of those and if there are challenges we see how we can plug in so that yes. is how it happens for every i have given you two zones but it happens with every single function which we where the customer touches us no i i i think it's very interesting of how customer experience is measured in two aspects right like one is the more emotional angle or or real angle and then one is the more business angle which is the ltv angle right uh, where, and and plus you said a lot of parameters go into how you define the customer love and i've after again you know working with various uh, various clients in bfsi we've realized that everyone has defined their in their way of measuring um, the brand love or the or 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 the customer love in that matter right um, okay oh, on to you right because you run so many campaigns for so many clients right how do you measure whether those campaigns are delivering the right kind of customer experience and what are the metrics that you track for your clients uh, so so obviously sitting between two extremes one is a simple approach and obviously one is a i'm assuming a complicated algorithm calculating customer love but i feel that uh, the at least our approach always has been the simpler it is the more easy to calculate it is the more easy it is to follow implement and track on a daily basis or a weekly basis monthly basis whatever you prefer so obviously app ratings is obviously you know ear to the ground what social media is saying and you know what the customers are saying but other than that you know what are the typical retention metrics on the apps for example day 1 day 7 day 15 day 30 that is what to do keep a very close track on the uninstall rate that is happening whether it's going up and down but very very actionable measurable metrics uh, is what we have always recommending and what we are always proposing yeah interesting um i think i think all the matrix can actually <laughs> define customer experience like your ctrs will start defining customer if you look at it right everything someone saw a or and someone told me that someone saw a red car ad and then it landed on the landing page and saw a black car ad leads to a drop off 
Okay, because he was looking at a red car and when he reached on, a, on your page, why didn't he see the red car again? I, I'm saying customer experience can be as simple as, as this. Uh, okay, on this note, uh, I want to open, this question, uh, open the forum to, for questions if there are any uh, in, from the audience. Uh, thank you so much for being such a lovely audience. Thank you so much, panelists, for you know, joining us on this session.